at two in the morning, there's probably somebody. Um, so I, I, I don't want to open up a can of worms here, but um, I think that, that, that there is, when we talk about how men and women deal with having a child that's often differently, I mean, you can't say that it's true of everybody, but there are patterns and dynamics that you see over and over again. And kind of um, a typical thing you'll see is that, that men will try to minimize the problem. They'll say that there's not a problem as long as they can. Mm -hmm. um, and that often you'll see that, that women, for lack of a better word, will maximize the problem, right? Get really involved trying to figure out everything that they can do. Maybe beyond the, the, the time, you know, number of hours in the day to, to, to address it. And you get this real kind of conflict here, right? That, I'm not the only one in the room who's <laughs> experienced this, right? But that that you, that you have two very different attitudes toward dealing with this, and um, I don't know what the solution is. I mean, I, I I think that that you know both my wife and I really want to help my son as much as we can, but that there there is kind of this this just this way of thinking about the problem that that just the way that you approach it that causes tension. And that maybe that's something that can be addressed, number one, to, to help families deal with this. And I think another thing that's, that, that is there that may explain why there aren't as many men in these meetings is that these meetings may seem like they, they cause more stress, right? If you're trying to minimize a problem and you don't want to dwell on it, then being in a, in a room like this and talking about problems um, may be a source of stress, right? So perhaps if the if it's, you know, maybe there's some way to make it seem like a, a way to reduce, reduce stress, that might attract women. Um, I am on several email lists for and for just another mental health, and I can give uh, uh, some really good ones. One of them is called grasp, G-R-A-S-P dot O-R-G, and another one is called Mad Girls, M A D G R R L S. That's for women only. Then there's I N L V, which has Martin Decker, which is M A R T I J N D E K K E R. Then there's um. Tara, maybe why don't you send? Yeah. You, you can send me all those, and I will make. Yeah. Them then. On yeah. The and then there's some Asper's relationships and women with Asperger's as well the Yahoo groups, and some of them are absolutely awesome. Yeah, and I get emails from Tara. Um, she's so great about sending out tons of information on a variety of topics. Oh, yeah. On ASD, so, yeah. Nice. Great. Can I just uh, follow up on the comments from the gentleman here? Um, one of the things we know, I remember learning when I was in training, was that human beings, by death, uh, in general, really a poor ambivalence, but being in an ambivalent state, not uh, being torn between two different things. And what you end up seeing with parents is that because there's always ambivalence, this child is really, really in trouble, or the child's fine. This child has lots of strengths, or has lots of strengths, or has lots of problems. And, and it's so hard for a single person to contain that, is that parents split it apart. And you see it very commonly that one parent will take on one part of the ambivalence, and the other part takes the other part of the ambivalence, and they don't know that they're doing this. They're not conscious of the fact they're doing this. And I think there probably are cultural patterns, as, 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 as you say, where men are much more cognitively solution oriented. We don't talk, we don't talk about this the solution here. Right? And this is what is this all about? What do we achieve today? Um, and so I think that does happen. Um, and I think part of the you know helping families make move forward is, is getting parents to recognize that you're not the enemy. You're actually part of me. Right? This is part of me that I've given you, the, the, the pessimism or the optimism, and in order to share it and, and bring it back. But it's almost a, a, a healthy mechanism in some ways for, for that to get, for, for it's, it's adaptive at times for you to split those things apart. It can become maladaptive as well. But um, um, anyway, that was my point. Yeah, but you're absolutely right. When, when you get that kind of polarization, right? I mean, the, what keeps that polarization going is that you take a really strong stance because if you don't take such a strong stance then the other person will come a little closer you know but the moment that one or the other takes a strong stance then it, it's further further polarizes uh, a couple or any relationship
But I think that, I mean, one of the things we can do, and I'd like to come out with this from social workers having to be the gateway to all this, you know, for parents and that it's inadequate, um, is if, if I look at what it was like for me starting out when there wasn't um, so many organizations, there's so many ways to access information or early diagnosis, and all those things didn't exist. Um, if they didn't have to begin the arduous journey to find out, it wouldn't get the stress from it to begin with. So if we can give people information, have them deal with the resources, and I'm not pretending to know the resources, where you're dealing with some sort of medical professional as your first contact, um, who can help you navigate, who can give you information, who can give you that future look about mental health without having to say, take your child to a psychiatrist and get them on meds. It's not what we're saying. That can um, give you a foresight into school and what you need to prepare. Because what happens is people are bashing around on their own, trying to <coughs> figure it out, and they end up bashing away at each other. And marriages break up, and families disintegrate. Because of the intense amount of time. And we're all building the same wheel over and over and over again. So I'm not saying there's a, a, a right answer for each family. Every, the answer is it's all very individual. And you have to find service providers you're comfortable with, and your child will have different issues from other children. But there are basic things for the, for, the, for the big wheel you have to be able to start out with. So if you have all that information, that general, like I was saying, for broad stroke information, where you, you know, when I look at the families that I've worked for who um, <coughs> advertised a job on, say, AV support or PDBC, and I applied, and they got an uh, uh, experienced behavior interventionist, right? Where they went to the act list and they got a, behavior, and they got a behavior consultant. But they went to the act list and they got an SLP. It was very different than me sitting around with this woman that I just met that I hardly knew and nine other families going, so what do you want to do? What do you think we should do about the whole autism thing? <laughs> like what, what, what professionals do we need? What are the treatments? Oh, there's a program at UCLA. Maybe we should read about that. Like, but maybe that's not the answer. And then there's all, you know, but there's, there's some, there's, from the behavior piece, there's some really good um, systems um, things that you can access easily, and I think for the other services, for, for counseling, for <coughs> mental health, for, um, for recreation, for leisure, for diet, I mean, God bless the Canucks <laughs> and what they're doing. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, j just by that organization getting involved, it makes, it gives autism a sense of normalcy. Right? Hockey players are involved, it's better than normal, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we can take a huge amount of stress on families by giving them information. And the other piece that I have found along the way is we provide families with huge amounts of stress by withholding the information. So when I first went to my social worker, I wouldn't hold all the programs. And I don't pretend to understand why they did that. All I know is that when I go to my family doctor and I have a problem, um, you know, for example, um, say I had a, oh, this would be personal, I had a mammogram and I found the lump and I had all these services, but I went to the family doctor, I went to the services, they put me through the specialist, they sent me for the ultrasound. I didn't get, oh, you have a lump in your breast, off you go. There are services out there that may or may not help you. <laughs> and there are service providers, but we, we, we can't tell you because we don't want to bias you and off you go. That is not what my family doctor said. He put me in charge. We went for the ultrasound, we went for the biopsy, we sent it away to the specialist, we waited for the tests to come back. You know, it came back negative. We were very happy. <laughs> and it come back positive, there were more steps, but that was the end of those steps. We are not doing that for families in British Columbia. We are doing the, you have autism, fly and be free. No. <laughs> I don't want to fly and be free, and I don't want to go alone. Um, it's better than it was, and it's not quite that bad. I am making a joke. But. We have time for one more question. Thank you. Um, I just want to ask Tara this question. Yeah. It's regarding your um, a Asperger diagnosis and how it affected the navigation of um, getting mental health assistance. I got none. Oh, okay. So I had to source everything myself. I was lucky. I was at UBC and I ate a chocolate bar and I got kicked out of an eating disorder group. And I was lucky to get Dr. Chen, who was a psychiatrist for a few years. And then I had to source all the information myself. I found all the Yahoo groups and all the other stuff all by myself. There's nothing out there for adults who are diagnosed. Getting it two months before you graduate from UBC is like, is kind of, you, you wonder like, why wasn't this noticed earlier? Mm -hmm. 
So there's nothing, and I'm still searching for things, and the autism community is not connected whatsoever, and they don't want information. Like I had to search at my own um, autism identification cards, and I, I found template for uh, um, a medical information, which has this on my medic, like my medical diagnosis, which comes which can, comes in very handy when you're at the emergency hospital calls. Yeah. And I had to find all that by myself and putting it together. But there is nothing out there for us. And it's, there's no communication whatsoever. And she's right. Here, you, even if you told that, it's like, now go be free. And the services are not exactly appropriate. Like, that's on vacation services is great. But they don't really, they're not specific for people with Asperger's. It's for mental health. And then they will encourage you to take, but it's nine dollars an hour jobs instead of, but gee, you can work more than that. They don't take into consideration the university um, education, and it's very, very frustrating to find even more more paid work when you need more work. It, it's like very frustrating. Well, thank you. And so I'm just wondering, you know, for adults that have not been diagnosed, is there a benefit to it because you don't get the medicine benefit anymore? And you know what it is at least. General. We know question it is for Tara, least. please. Just a quick one for Tara, please. Uh -huh. Do you find that women like you with Asperger's diagnosis are easily uh, abused in this society? Um, I don't really know per se, um, but there is this book called Asperger, Asperger's by Rudy Simone, and it talks about women with Asperger's. Um, but a lot of us are undiagnosed because it's more visible for us because we, we tend to be fit in more than guys. We can spot very easy with um, the trains and all the other, the classic train. And they're, they're more anti-social and more rough and tumble. I think because girls present differently is from what I understand yeah. and that's yeah. why they're because we're women, we get blocked out in the community. Mm -hmm. But just that's what um, they I think they're finding now, Kara, is yeah. that as the community and we all start learning more about ASD, that really it does affect women just mm -hmm. like men, but they present a little bit differently because yeah. we're culturally, as we we're talking, different. Because I know women. one person who was diagnosed like as a child because hers was really more pronounced, mm -hmm. like it was, she got um, diagnosed because she was stalking by, um, so as so the story goes, and she, she bugged him to death, mm -hmm. and so they, um, then the, the doctor where she lived um, diagnosed her in, in like a couple of minutes flat, and then she was sent to Vancouver, and spent an additional three weeks in the hospital just to confirm the diagnosis of Asperger's. Mm -hmm. And me only took like two sessions. So, and I was lucky. And I find that being diagnosed early has, it's con I find that people who are diagnosed early get coddled a lot. And then they have no sense of manners whatsoever and don't know how to behave. Mm -hmm. And well, all those who are diagnosed later, they at least had a chance of jobs and they, their family has taught them manners. I find that the, the disability equates to like, oh, but you have this building, so we don't need to teach you how to so behave with us, yeah. and we're going to let you be, and we'll give you, oh, special education, mm -hmm. and, oh, alternate math is all well and good, but I know very well for a fact that uh, alternate math will not get you past, it will not get you a university degree, and so I was lucky I did uh, math in summer school, and they begged me, they love it, do not take grade 12 math in Bye. <laughs> I was exactly. very happy. So I felt that they passed me in with because I tried. And yeah, it's better to go through the normal uh, route as much as you can. Uh, so it's better not to maybe <clears throat> allow people to make a preconceived um, judgment about you already because you have this label. And if they didn't know that, they would just treat you because it's invisible. They would treat you very much like everybody else. Yeah, I told somebody at Asperger's one that volunteering, and she said, but you're so smart. <laughs> and that's, that's so and they're not really understanding. And then I had someone tell me, but I'm sorry to hear about um, your condition, or nice to know about your sickness. 
Thank you for making my parents, by the way, who are no longer alive. They <laughs> sent an article about me, which was published in Vancouver Sun, but, but it's like, when they say the most insulting was, but you're so smart, it's like, does that mean having autism, Asperger's, that you, you're dumb? It's like they thought, you, you, it means that you're dumb if you have Asperger's, it's like, I think what, with my son, he would rather I say to people, um, he has some challenges, and in that way, people can make up their own challenges, so they can decide for themselves when they meet him, oh, it, they don't know, it's invisible, so there's nothing, really, unless you know him disorder. very well. It's a, I, I equate to being communication disorder in many ways, and that basically is a good thing.